Doc? Sure, I got it. Oh, here, let me make sure I approve of the recording and <laughs> don't leave the meeting. <laughs> I'll click on the wrong button. Turn up a little bit. Uh, All right, we good to go? Sure. All right, well, just a quick introduction. I'm Kim Hahn, the Public Affairs Officer with 12 Live Fire and Rescue. Thanks so much for having me join you this evening. I know we haven't been able to attend these meetings. Our crews would usually attend them in person, but as you can imagine, things have been a little crazy and um, it's a little bit challenging on that front with the virtual world and having them all log on, but it's fun for me to be able to pop on to some of these meetings every once in a while. So I would definitely appreciate your time. When you don't have me, available or someone able to pop on to one of these to give you an update. We are doing pre-recorded video updates. It's on our YouTube channel. And uh, Chief, our fire chief, Chief Derek Weiss, he records a version. And then we also have Gennaro Esparza, who is a Spanish speaking firefighter captain actually with us. Um, he does a Spanish version. And so we try to stay up on top of those every other month just to provide, and they're literally for the NACs and the CPOs specifically, but obviously anyone from the community can watch them. Um, so if you ever get a chance to, or you can add that, if you need something added to your agenda, you guys can always watch that. Um, and hopefully that's helpful because we try and list off everything that we've got going on. So, but today you get a live update from me. So um, I'm just gonna um, let you know kind of what we've been up to, which I can tell you, besides obviously COVID response. Uh, now it's been vaccines, vaccination clinics and whatnot. We've been keeping so busy with those. In fact, I just checked our stats. We have administered 23,223 doses as of today. Uh, that includes first doses and second doses, not only to our frontline responders, but also to a lot of the community members that have qualified to get or been eligible to get their vaccine. And so we're, we're doing them in Washington County, Clackamas County, and Yamhill County as of right now. You, you probably even heard that we've been out at the Nike campus. We're gonna try and keep that partnership going. Um, we've got a partnership built with City of Beaverton. They're helping us out, not only with traffic control with PD, but the CERT program. Uh, so that's been super awesome. And, and just for clarification on those vaccination clinics, because we get a lot of people calling us saying, how can I get my vaccine? We are administering the vaccine, doing the shot in the arm, but they're still all going through the county. So you still wanna go through Washington County. They've actually got a pretty comprehensive website. If you go to the main Washington County website and click on vaccine, they're constantly updating that, including where to sign up, where there's gonna be local clinics. It's kind of been changing on a regular basis as you probably notice, as opposed to like the Oregon Convention Center. But I know a lot of folks would probably rather just stay on this west side. I know I prefer usually staying on the west side for everything. Um, so just keep an eye out there. And obviously there's still the Oregon Health Authority website, which that can um, walk you through finding a vaccine clinic too and getting signed up. And then 211, they've really beefed up staffing there too. So, um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone can get their vaccine, obviously as soon as they're eligible or has gotten one if, since they've been eligible. But I know it has been a little bit frustrating, but um, everyone's doing the best that they can. So I'm um, in non-COVID news. Uh, we did, and, and this is actually what instigated Carl reaching out to us. We did send out some information and we've got some information posted on our website. We're starting a recruitment process for firefighters and sole paramedics. The academies are gonna start early 2022, but we start the recruiting process now. We've got some virtual options where people can um, zoom in and, and talk to some of our firefighters and our paramedics to learn more about the job. So if you or anyone you know is interested in becoming a firefighter or a paramedic with us, um, by all means, send them to tvfr.com or they could call our main line and get connected up with our HR folks. And then uh, we've been posting stuff on social media too about any kind of virtual um, uh, meeting type situations where people can call in and talk with our folks. And let's see, well, I always have to throw in the fun safety update. So as we've all noticed with the beautiful weather, it's getting nice out and we might start cracking open our windows. And so this is just a reminder um, for those that have kids in the house, whether it's grandkids or your own kids or you're, you know, running a daycare out of the facility or something. We've got that stop at four campaign that the um, Oregon Safe or Safe Kids Oregon has put together. And it's just that reminder to Keep that gap in your window to no more than four inches and you can get the door locks or stoppers or or even window cover uh, uh i can't remember what they're called um there's little window guards that you can get in there because you know just a reminder that bugs keep 
the screens keep the bugs out, but the screens don't keep the kids in. And so we see approximately 50 kids falling uh, from windows that are under the age of 13 every year here in Oregon. And they're often entered into um, the trauma system with life-threatening injuries. And those are one of the worst calls we could ever go on and law enforcement runs on those too. And it's really, really, it's horrible. It's horrible to see what the families have to go through. So spread the word on that as much as you can. People can go to safekidsoregon.org for more information on that. And that's it for me. Um, thanks again for having me. Thank okay, you. One quick question. Yes. Um, do you think there's a chance you guys might open up for uh, letting us uh, use your space uh, for a, a meeting next fall? Because we used you know, to have uh, all... Station 65 at least once a year, but I don't know what the deal is with the uh, Portland Public Schools right now. I'm just wondering if, do you think that the uh, TVF and R might open up some of their, speci well, specifically East Station 65? Uh, yeah. You want us to come meet in, in person after everyone gets vaccinated? Yep, the plan, yeah, the plan is right now, obviously, yeah, all of our facilities are closed, including the community rooms. Um, but the plan is right now is, yeah, once that vaccine gets rolled out and we start hearing from public health officials that things are much safer and that we're getting to a point where COVID is basically eradicated, I'm, I am would love it if that was in the fall. I don't want to be too overpromising to anyone. And I'm definitely no Dr. Fauci, um, but it's one of those things where, yeah, we've got, a, we actually have a reintegration plan that I have been a huge part of putting together and it walks us through the different modes. And so once we get to what we are called, what's called primary mode or routine operations, we'll get to that point, but that requires us to have that community immunity or herd immunity you've probably heard about to where it's safe because we don't want to instigate obviously any outbreaks. We don't wanna put our own community members at jeopardy either by saying, yeah, go ahead and pack this community room with 30 people. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's an outbreak. I mean, can you imagine how devastating we'd feel? So we're really monitoring that closely because we know how valuable those community rooms are. And that one at station 65 is fantastic. So yeah, I mean, as long as, you know, we'll, we'll obviously we'll have to revisit who was using those rooms before and on what night and things like that and make sure that we can coordinate that calendar again. But we do have intentions of reopening those because, you know, otherwise, especially that new of a station, I mean, that we can fit people in there. We do have some stations where they're much older stations and those community rooms were taken over by like a fitness room or a day room because we also had to have our own crews space out and physically distance as well but yeah no as soon as and i'm yeah i'm hopeful it's fall but i i'm not sure i wish i had the crystal ball <laughs> All right. I, I'll, I'll bug you again in september yes you've got my contact information so you bug me anytime because i'll be your point of contact on okay cool but, yeah any other questions all right well i i would i would add thank you very much you know i would i would add for all the veterans that uh, the VA is starting to expand uh, immunizations to veterans that are not, that don't, don't normally go to the VA for their medical care. So for all of you that are veterans, check with the VA. And um, I was really impressed with uh, how efficient they were. So, for, so if you're a veteran, uh, go check them out. I don't know how many people that covers in the group, but surely some. <laughs> Okay. Well, like once again, thank you, Kim. Um, I don't see uh, Troy here or Officer Wilson. So, I go ahead. You give us yeah. the uh, report from the uh, city of Beaverton. Great. Well, it's great to see all of you. I don't really get to come to your meetings that often because you're on a council meeting night. So I'm really happy to see you. And I have a pretty short update. Um, so I'll just kind of get right to it. Uh, the first one is that we held the, the state of the city this um, earlier this month. Our mayor, uh, Lacey Beatty, she kicked it off on March 4th and we have it available online. So you can also view it if you didn't get a chance to see it. 
and it's at beavertonoregon.gov forward slash SOTC. And I'll put that in the, the chat here too. And, you know, she talked about, uh, you know, our, there are recent accomplishments as well as our upcoming, um, her upcoming plans during her first state of the city address for this coming year. And I think um, it's just a, a great uh, video to watch if you've got some time to take a look at it. And then the second item is that we have a May special election coming up. If you weren't aware, we have a, an open city council or open um, council seat. And so that will be filled the May 18th election. And this Thursday is the filing deadline. And so um, if you want to look for who's filed for that, we, we put all the, the information of the candidates that have filed. And, and if you're interested in filing, you still have time. It's five o'clock on Thursday. Uh, it's at beavertonoregon.gov forward slash elections. And I won't steal the thunder. Terry can talk about what BCCI is up to in that vein of, of, um, of the, the elections items. And then the next um, piece that is also going on uh, in the coming weeks is that the Public Safety Center has a plaza naming process underway. And that we're asking the community to um, submit uh, naming suggestions for the recent completed outdoor public plaza at the Beaverton's Public Safety Center. And the deadline for this process is March 31st. And if you go to beavertonoregon.gov at PSC Plaza, you can um, submit your suggestions or you can also call going online isn't your thing. And uh, you know, any suggestion is welcome and can include a Beaverton res resident, either deceased or living, a tribal name or a general suggestion. A detailed explanation uh, to give context for consideration is requested. And one thing we would just add is that the more information you provide, the, um, the more helpful it is for the folks reviewing all the different nominations. And we do have a committee of volunteers who are reviewing all of, all of these public submissions. And they're gonna make a selection of uh, three to five names for the city council's consideration to take a look at in June. And then the unveiling of this event will be held in August, you know, either virtual or in person if we're there yet, um, to celebrate the, the name selection and then the recently completed uh, installation of this public art sculpture um, in the plaza. Hmm. And then the last piece is that we're currently underway with the city manager recruitment. And if you weren't aware, we have an interim city manager um, who was just hired for six months. And so right now we're now looking for the long um, term hire. And uh, this position is gonna serve as the city administrative's head and report to city council for the daily operation of city services and programs. And we have all the information about the hiring process on our website as well for this uh, uh, process. And we're gonna be um, launching a survey as well for um, the community to participate. And, and we also did a social um, hour to get to know the candidate finalists uh, for the last interim hiring process. And we'll do that again for this process as well. So stay tuned for more details to come on that so that you can be part of, of that. And we're really hoping that the appointment um, is, is completed and uh, in, in completed by summer so that onboarding um, can be underway and we have a smooth transition. So any questions about those items or any other questions that I can either answer or get more details for you? We're gonna have a parade next fall? I don't know, I don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a big iffy, yeah. Um, I, you know, the problem about event planning, for those of you that haven't been involved in event planning, is usually you have to start planning six months in advance. And we already have guidelines in, in play now that say that the, the parade as we know it wouldn't work um, with the current guidelines. So it makes it really hard to do event planning for those larger events. It's a lot easier to plan smaller scale or medium sized events because you can easily scale those back. But a big event like the parade, it's really challenging because all those contracts and uh, plans have to be actually implemented you know, right about now. And it's just too early to know what's 
things are going to be like in September, because if we have a big outbreak and then all of a sudden more guidelines come down to go back to a different phase, um, it was all for naught. So, um, so definitely we have, you know, a really savvy events team that's looking at what our options are and they'll keep the, um, all, all of you in the loop. They'll be sending out updates of what our city events are looking like. They just did also give a city council update recently to talk about their vision to provide more um, small scale events into the neighborhoods. And I think that might be something that you'd be interested in and we'll be sharing those details so you can hear more about that and what that might look like. Um, I think that's a little bit easier during these really, um, you know, unforeseeable, you know, or unpredictable times, I guess is a better way to say it. So instead of picnic in the park, it'll be picnic in my backyard. <laughs> Not quite like that, but maybe, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, stay tuned. I, I know they're really working hard. I, our events team met with uh, THPRD to talk about what could some of these events look like. Um, and so they're reimagining what, what could this be that could bring some we know it's really helpful to have um, things to look forward to, to get people out of the house, but we wanna keep things safe um, and do our part. So uh, uh, so I, I can't wait to share more details as they get firmed up, but um, they still are percolating and lots of meetings behind, um, behind the scenes are going um, on right now. So more, more details to come. Hey Carl, that might work pretty well since so you already have the potty set up out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just appreciate the fact that, yeah, City of is taking it easy. They're not pulling a Texas and opening everything yeah. up, you know? Uh, I like it that they're, everyone's going slow and making sure everything's good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Lenny. It was great. Anybody else have any more questions for the city? Uh, mm -hmm. drove, drove past the uh, Performing Arts Center site. Uh, a couple of days ago and really just amazed how much progress has been made. It's, uh, wow. it's really shaping up. Yeah. Good. All right, Terry, ready for a BCCI report? Okay. Um, following up on, on a, a topic that Lanny touched on, the, that is the election that's coming up in May. Um, we're going to have a voters forum. I know I mentioned that last month, but I'll just keep emphasizing it that um, we're going to have a voters forum, which again is a, it's going to be virtual and it's going to be moderated by Eric Schmidt, who is our professional moderator. He does a great job. And, and um, basically that what BCCI does is we, is we have a, there's a subcommittee that's uh, formed to work on the voters forum and they've been, been, uh, contacting all of the candidates and we're going to focus on the city council and and Lanny do you know how many members have signed up thus far I think it's four isn't it three um were official but there were two <clears throat> that were semi-official with a okay. third potentially official so potentially up to six okay so that will be um that will be a lot of time going through and, and questioning and having six people answer questions. And so we have this, uh, we've had a traditional for format where there are questions that have come in. We ask questions of, uh, that the community submit questions. We ask uh, certain uh, city uh, commissions and groups to submit questions like the um, Bicycle Advisory Board or the, um, help me here, Lanny, uh, HRAC, what is HRAC? Human Rights Advisory Council. I mean, there's a lot of boards that have specific interests um, and that they're all, everyone's encouraged and every, all of us are encouraged to submit questions. And there will be a postcard coming out um, probably a few weeks before the event uh, illustrating where and how you get your questions back to the um, BCCI committee who will then kind of vet them and and format them and uh, present them to our moderator for that. So we have a city council race, and then we also have a Tualatin Hills Parks and Rec board position, oh. which uh, we know for um, our NAC, 
um, is a bit of a raw spot there. So uh, maybe we want to get our, maybe we want to get these guys to come to our April meeting. That's a thought. Um, and when we get, when we know who's uh, signed up to run for that position. Mm, good idea. Yeah, I was just going to throw in too that Highland kind of took it to a whole nother level last voter <clears> storm <throat> with their submitting of questions. So you're welcome as the NAC to submit a bunch of questions on behalf of West Slope NAC. And our moderator had a lot of fun um, saying, now this question comes from the West Slope NAC. So <laughs> feel free to do that. Yeah, so, uh, Maybe we should do so, that. so we have an opportunity to kind of, um, kind of give our perspective up here uh, at the Voters Forum on April 29th. So please, um, again, you'll get some information about how to zoom it, how to get in contact with the Zoom account and all that. Kind of stuff. <clears throat> Always an interesting evening. And um, we had the mayor come to BCCI last, um, our last meeting was February 22nd. And, um, and I just wanted to pass along uh, a certain tidbit. Um, she actually is setting aside time for um, folks to set up a, like a 15 minute contact uh, like a meeting with her and she's encouraging people to do so. So um, if you want to have some direct input into your city and its operations, um, you can avail yourself by uh, contacting the mayor's office and, and getting in on one of these 15 minute slots that she's setting up. I thought that was pretty Wait, Is that 15 minutes for the whole city or just 15 minutes for our NAC? It's 15 minutes for any individual who wants to sign up and have a have a session with the mayor. It's kind of like office hours. She's got office hours. Yeah, but she she's setting aside a certain yeah, fortune enough. of her office hours for that you know direct contact with her. Yeah. With her constituents. So, really? Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and um, I want to mention that um, BCCI has um, been in contact with the traffic commission. We, a couple of us went to the February, uh, March 4th traffic commission meeting because there are a number of neighborhoods and Highland is, is a prime example where they have had failed traffic calming projects within their, uh, the boundaries of their NAC and they are very frustrated with the process. Kind of like Lower current. Canyon Lane? Yeah, sort of like Canyon Lane. Again, the voting and, and the cards and the, who gets to vote and what is the percentage of, of a yes votes and all of the things that are associated with the way the program is administered currently. Um, and so BCCI uh, is going to be joining well, we're going to be creating a little subcommittee where we're going to be look, advocating for a re a relook at some of the traffic calming policies. Good. So um, more more to come on that. It's just in the very formative stages, um, and we're going to talk about it at our next BCCI meeting, which is this coming Monday, and there'll be more information following that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. From BCCI. Cool. Any questions? So, should we get together and maybe come up some questions for the mayor? I mean, or, well, we'll talk about that a little later because we're still, right. uh, we're still uh, in negotiation about changing on the nights of our meeting because we couldn't contact her tonight because she's at the city council meeting. Oh, that's right. So, if we meet, on Thursdays instead. I forgot. Uh, look, BCCI usually meets on Wednesday or Thursday, Terry? Monday. Oh, Monday. Okay, well, then we're fine there. So we could switch to Wednesday or Thursday. But then you got to think about Twalton Hills uh, Fire and Rescue and TVFNR. I mean, we just can't move everybody else around just because the mayor. Well, no, ask, ask Cam, man. They just show up when they feel like it. Oh, that's a little. <laughs> You're a little sassy tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't say it was going to happen next month. It's just going to be, yeah, we'll, we'll let everybody know and we'll work it out. All right. 
Well, I don't see BPD here tonight because she's probably busy or they, they I think she was saying there was, she was changing her shift and they're, therefore that yeah. they don't have a new rep yet. Or so I, I could be wrong on that, but we'll, yeah, we'll talk about it for uh, old business a little later. All right. All right. Well, in the meantime, I see Jacqueline Simons from the American Red Cross, who is going to give us our featured uh, event of the evening. Um, Carl, I, our audience has a question. Oh. So I'm going to, if, do you mind if we allow them to ask their question? Oh, who? Um, it's our call in, we have a call in listener. Oh, wow. Lucky us. So I've unmuted them. Bill shows muted on the screen. Five four one, man. What area code is that? That's the valley. Oh. Hello, Carl. Oh, okay. So can we hear Jacqueline yet? Uh, so I think you might have to do star star six at your end for the caller. There we go. Hello? Can you hear me yes. now? Yes. Hooray. Okay. Um, the, just, this is just uh, the Zoom link on the agenda and in the email invite was wrong. I've been trying to get in for a while, but I don't have the right Zoom link. The call-in number was right, but uh, I don't know if any other audience members were able to get in, but I'm not able to get in. Mm. Oh, no. I'm sorry about that. That would have been a problem at our end. Apologies. Hmm. That's all. I, was, I tried emailing and I tried calling, uh, but I... Uh, if somebody could respond to my email so I can get the Zoom link so I could get in, that would be great. Well, I can, per yes, absolutely. I can send that to you. <laughs> Sorry. That is all. Okay. Um, I sent the email to the neighborhood mail at Beaverton. Oregon. Okay. Gov. okay, I'll um, be doing that right now. So I'll um, look for that in a few minutes. Cool. Any idea how I mute myself again? Is it star six again? Try star six again. Um, I, actually, okay. I can do it from here. So I just did it. Yeah, you can do it. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacqueline. I am the preparedness manager with Red Cross. Um, is now a, a, a good time to start my presentation or any other pieces go. of yeah. business? Okay, good. <laughs> just just start making sure. Bit. Okay. Um, so I actually have some slides to share, um, and uh, but I'll be able to still see you all um, as well. So um, we're, I, I'm just going to give kind of a, a 30 minute presentation. Uh, it's a really an overview of our preparedness uh, presentation um, and welcoming questions and you know conversation uh, throughout the throughout the um, presentation and afterwards as well. Um, so let's see here. I one second. I'm not seeing what I need to see. Okay. Are you in the jungle? No. Okay. So uh, my background, <laughs> it's, it, it's, people think it looks tropical. It's actually France, um, which is decidedly not super tropical. Um, but, <laughs> but yes, I love the, the flowers. Oh, here we are. Hmm. Okay. So you should, uh, you should be able to see my PowerPoint. I said, yeah. I can, perfect. I can see you guys nodding. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So Really, uh, we like to kind of set a oops, set a um, context here, right? Of why it's important to talk about disasters, or uh, you know, in in the first place. Um, and the fact is really that disasters uh, happen, right? They happen often. They happen with little or no warning. And they can happen anywhere and really at any time. Um, and so, our kind of working uh, definition of a disaster is if a uh, the normal response systems are overwhelmed if people are hurt or if property is damaged or destroyed. And it's really you know, up to us, uh, you, me, us, to be ready. 
um, a lot of people assume that someone else will be there to help. Um, right? And I, I see Kim here from TVFNR, which is awesome. Um, but you know, first responders, disaster organizations, government agencies, hospital emergency rooms, right? They do their best, um, but resources just aren't there to support everyone immediately after um, an emergency or, or during a disaster. Because um, really on average, right, these groups are staffed and prepared for normal day-to-day -day operations and resources just really could be limited during, during a disaster. And so the truth is, right, we're gonna have to depend on ourselves first. Um, and a couple of those reasons why are, you know, the roads may be impassable, utilities may be unavailable, right? mm -hmm. hospitals, first responders could or will be overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, you know, banks, grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, right? The things that we take for granted that we could just run a quick errand to, they may be closed for days, um, maybe even weeks at a time, depending on how large the emergency is. Um, so the bottom line is really that we, well, we can't uh, count on receiving help right away. And so each of us can uh, prepare to help ourselves and our households. And Will preparation be perfect? No. Uh, will preparation make things quick, easy, or absolutely painless all the time? Not always. Uh, but planning and preparation will help us all to be safe and recover uh, more quickly uh, in the event of an emergency. So when we're prepared, we can take protective actions to be safe, right? If we know what those are ahead of time, we can react in the right ways adapt to tough challenges and recover quickly uh, from difficulties. And really, when we think about, you know, what does it take to be prepared? Uh, we break it down into three steps. Uh, to be informed, right? It's important that you're informed about what our local hazards are. Um, you know, learn the hazards we may face, uh, how you will get information if a disaster occurs, and what resources are available in your community. And this will allow you to quickly respond and to help yourself, your household and your community. Uh, we want to look at making a plan. So identifying the steps you'll take to respond to disasters, um, you know, decide who in your household will do what, where you will go, how you will communicate with each other. And then finally, that third step of building a kit. And your kit should contain the supplies you will need at home um, or can easily carry with you if you've uh, been asked uh, to evacuate. So we're going to start with the being informed section and talk a little bit about our hazards. So question for you guys, and you guys can just jump in. Which of these hazards do you think we face here in the Pacific Northwest? Not flood. <laughs> Not flood? No. We all live on a hill. No, we do, yeah. Okay. Now volcano, that's a definite. Oh, I don't think, know Mount St. Helens. Yeah. yeah. Not since 1980. Okay. Uh, yeah, our neighboring state is the proud owner of the only volcanic uh, response, <laughs> national response in the lower 48. <laughs> so we get, we're, we're proud of that in this region, right? <laughs> yeah. Makes us famous. What else do you think we face here? All of yeah, it. Face thunderstorms. We just had one yesterday. Uh, landslide, definitely a, available around here. Winter storm, of course. Right, just had one of those. <laughs> Extreme heat for us is eighty-five degrees. Yes. So, Carl, you actually um, you, you're touching on something, right? So, this is the answer, right? Everything except a traditional hurricane. But you know, to Carl's point, right? Some of these things are relative. Right, our winter storm looks different than you know maybe a nor'easter from the northeast, but it still affects our community, um, and it's our definition of a of a disaster. Right, extreme heat. You're right. We're, you know, it gets over ninety, and we're in trouble. Right, some of our community members are in trouble, and uh, so, you know, our tornadoes that we have in this uh, state in this region not regularly and they're relatively small, but they do, they cause property damage, they cause you know, bodily harm. We had that large one, uh, several, well, large for us, right? Several years ago in Almsville, Oregon, uh, people, oh, yeah. you know, people perished in that, right? So we had the tornado out in Tillamook County that destroyed some, some buildings. So 
it's all relative, but they're, you know, they're emergencies to us. Um, and we like to just point out uh, whenever, whenever we get a group together um, that a home fire is actually the number one emergency of, of any of them. And sometimes people don't really consider that, right? When we think of disasters, we think of those big impactful things like earthquakes and wildfires where they're gonna affect a whole community. Um, and yes, right, those are important to think of and we'll continue to kind of think of that when we talk about making a plan and building a kit, but a home fire is by far the most common frequent emergency. You are much more likely to experience a home fire than really anything else. And as a nation, more people are injured and die in home fires each year than all of the other uh, emergencies combined in any given year. So we'd like to just point that out um, just to bring some attention to that because sometimes that kind of emergency kind of flies under the radar uh, because it affects one family, uh, maybe multiple families if it's an apartment building or something like that. But uh, that's always kind of top of mind for us. I, I see Kim nodding her head because right, Red Cross, fire departments, we work, we work closely together. Um, so we know, uh, and in this region, Red Cross responds to about two home fires a day um, on average. And that's what, who we respond to, right? We know that there's more fires happening um, and, and folks just aren't, um, you know, calling us for assistance. And so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a lot when we put it all together. Um, but so good job, everyone pretty much got all the answers to that. Um, so also when we think about being informed, right, it's not just about, know. it's not just okay. about uh, knowing our hazards, right, but identifying how we will get information. Um, you know, are we, uh, do we have a radio, right? Carl, you said you had one of those. That's great. Uh, does the radio, you know, is it crank radio? Is it a solar radio? Is it battery powered, right? How are we going to get information? Um, you may, um, download different apps for your smartphone, which is great, um, but it's also important to have that backup that doesn't rely on internet um, in case like, there is a kind of a larger scale emergency. Um, understanding weather alerts are all things that we need to be aware of as well. The uh, watch versus a warning, right? A, a winter storm watch versus a winter storm warning. Um, the uh, fire evacuation levels for like a wildfire um, understanding what level one, level two, level three means. Um, and for watch versus warning, I, I love the cupcake metaphor. Has anyone heard the cupcake metaphor? So you can have a cupcake watch and a cupcake warning. So a cupcake watch, you've got all the ingredients, they're sitting on your counter. It could, a cupcake could happen. It could, right? A cupcake warning, it is in the oven. Like there will be a cupcake. I like that. In, a, in mere moments, right? So that's kind of how I, well, I like cupcakes and I like to bake, but that's how I like to kind of understand the difference between those, right? The watch, you've got all the ingredients there. They're putting you on notice, right? It could happen if things get mixed together, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to happen. And a warning is it's eminent or it, I mean, it's, it's happening. It's in the oven. It's in the oven. That's right. Um, and so like I said, when we understand those different watches and warnings and evacuation mm -hmm. levels, we can follow the instructions that authorities tell us, right? If we're being asked to evacuate, we understand that that's what they're asking us to do, right? Um, if there's a, you know, a, it'd be weird here, but if we had a tornado warning, right, we would know that, you know, okay, that means that you know, it's happening now, like we need to take action, right? Versus just being aware that there could be, you know, something happening if it was a watch. Um, knowing your neighbors is a great way to uh, take that, you know, take that step to understand what their needs are, um, how you can help them, how they can help you, who are these people. Um, so that if, like the, the, I love presenting to neighborhood associations because you guys kind of lean this way anyways of being interested in knowing who your neighbors are mm -hmm. and, and communicating with each other, right? Um, and then knowing what to do when you're traveling. That's another part about being informed. Um, I often share the story that a couple years ago, I found myself in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, beautiful city, had a great time. But while I was there, they had a tornado warning. 
I am, I'm born and bred in Portland. I did not, I did not know what to do with that. <laughs> right. I was like, I'm come again. Like, how do I keep myself safe? Right. I had lots of questions. I didn't even know it was tornado season when I went there. Um, and so these are things that, you know, we can, we can do ahead of time and, you know, we will be traveling for fun again soon. If we're traveling to different parts of the country, uh, different parts of the world, right? Understanding what maybe some of those different hazards are and uh, knowing ahead of time, you know, how we can keep ourselves. And if we're with people, right? How do we can keep ourselves safe? Um, so that's kind of our, our first section about just kind of being informed, um, knowing your hazards, uh, you know, taking some of those steps ahead of time uh, to learn like your watches and warnings and, and um, things like that. And so our second part, really, when we're talking about making a plan, um, we, you know, there's several kind of things to consider, right? There's the likely disasters, right? So like I said, the most frequent emergency would be a home fire, um, but our potentially most impactful emergency would be something like, you know, what we saw this last fall with a wildfire, right? That, that affected a large, a group, a large, you know, multiple communities. Um, our earthquake risk also, you know, that's going to impact our entire region. Um, and so when you kind of think about how you want to prepare for things, right, you can think about what's most likely to happen, or is it if you're prepared for the earthquake, you're prepared for a lot of other potential emergencies, because that's the most impactful one. Um, so, you know, considering, you um, if someone in your household uh, travels or is away from home, maybe they're in the military, right? They're away for long periods of time. Um, you know, how, how will you all work together as a team? Um, and how will you kind of plan if they're going to be you know, away for, for a while, right? That plan if they're here and plan if they're away. Um, and then individuals with access and functional needs will need to prepare a bit differently. Um, so we encourage people to create a personal support network that can help plan and provide assistance if a disaster happens. And remember, you know, not to depend on just one person, but we really like to um, recommend at least a minimum of three people within that network. Mm. Completing a personal assessment of functional abilities and possible needs during and after a disaster situation and making sure that you're practicing these disaster plans uh, with your personal support network at least twice a year. Um, and that's, you know, that's with the focus and a lens of, of uh, folks with access and functional needs, but I think it's an applicable um, thought process for really anyone, right? Uh, creating that personal support network um, is, is important. And then don't forget to think about what you'll do with your pets um, and so, and service animals, right? So most American Red Cross shelters uh, cannot accept pets because of health and safety concerns and other considerations, but service animals are always allowed in Red Cross shelters. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you guys this, what are the two federally recognized service animals? There's one in the picture. Dog. <laughs> dog. What's the other one? Very cool dog. What was that? I said that's a really cool looking dog. Yeah, it's like a husky or something, right? <laughs> it's really pretty. Any of your ponies. Yes, Chris, for the win. Yes, it's a miniature pony. Wow. Um, so a dog and a miniature pony are the only federally recognized uh, service animals. Now, I can tell you from a Red Cross point of view, we absolutely recognize that all the other pets are very important to people, right? And so we, we strive to allow pets in our shelter. And it really just kind of depends um, if we have enough space, right, to keep some space between people that maybe have allergies or fear uh, of animals. Um, and if we cannot provide that additional space for pets, we are constantly working with our partners to identify you know, safe locations um, through the county or through other nonprofit groups, right, uh, to help have a safe place for those for the other kinds of animals to go. Um, so animals is top priority because uh, we understand everyone, you know, Everyone's pets are very important to them. Um, we had a kangaroo, I kid you not. We had a kangaroo at a shelter 
out in Golden Dale, Washington, out the gorge, that was not allowed into the shelter. We had to, we had to draw the line there. <laughs> it stayed in the car, but you know, people come up with all kinds and we, we want to be able to accommodate as, as, as much as we can, uh, you know, people's pets. So uh, we want to, you know, plan, plan for, for those guys too. And then when we're thinking about some of the details the, that we want to include, right? Um, questions around how to evacuate, um, identifying evacuation routes, right? Not just out of your home, like in the event of a home fire, you want to kind of know where your exits are, but if you needed to evacuate your neighborhood, how would you? What, some, what are some options and where would they take you, right? Um, where would you meet? Uh, do you have a meeting spot in your neighborhood? And maybe you have a meeting spot outside your neighborhood. Like if, if you were outside your neighborhood and couldn't come back in, where would you, you know, potentially meet some people in your household or friends or family members? Where will you stay if you need to evacuate? And when, when we're talking about planning in some of these conversations, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. It, the, the important thing is having the conversation, right? So where will you stay if you need to evacuate? Um, if you identify a friend or a family member who kind of lives outside your, your area a little bit and you say, hey, I'm going to head there, make sure they know that they're part of your plan <laughs> um, so that, you know, they can expect you or they can, you know, be in contact, right? What if their plan is to leave and you show up and they're not there, right? Um, if your plan is to go to a Red Cross shelter um, or you know, we don't have shelters right now because of COVID, we would put you up in a hotel room, but, you know, finding that kind of like um, place, that Red Cross place where you could find that information, um, how will you learn about that, right? Um, making sure that you, you know, if you, if that's your plan, um, following us on social media, um, downloading the app so that we can share that information with you. If there's no internet, um, again, having that radio so that we can you know, share that information so that you know where you need to head. If you're being asked to shelter in place, what does that look like? What are your needs? How do they change if you're being asked to stay where you are? Um, and we'll talk about sheltering in place in terms of kits in a second. And then putting those important records together ahead of time. Um, and so we, you know, we want to put things like insurance, like policy information, um, you want to gather those ahead of time, right? In the middle of an emergency, you're not going to remember your policy number, right? Um, I mean, you barely remember it on a good day, right? That's always stuff you're going to have to look up anyways. And so having a copy of that available, um, having a copy of um, your prescription information so that we can refill prescriptions, right? That's all um, important information to have. Uh, copies of marriage licenses, divorce decrees, um, you know, things like that that are in, important to kind of rebuild and recover, we want copies of those. Um, so we want to put them into our kit, but also, you know, that's part of that uh, planning process is identifying what's important and, and um, getting copies of it. Um, we do recommend uh, carrying a contact card. Um, and uh, it does say to memorize the emergency contact. I, I think we're in the middle of an emergency, we might not be able to remember it, even if we think we've memorized it. Um, and we don't want to be totally dependent on our cell phones. Um, I don't know anyone's phone number anymore, right? Because they're, they're just, they're in my phone. Um, and so writing those phone numbers down is very helpful so that if you uh, can make a phone call or, um, you know, if your cell phone battery, um, you know, Goes, goes out, but you make it someplace that has a phone you can use, you, ha you have the ability to know what those phone numbers are and make those calls. And including someone who lives outside your area, like really outside the area, like outside the state. Um, oftentimes if we do have cell service and things like that, it's really difficult to call each other in a neighborhood or in a community, but we can get a call outside the area. And so identifying someone that you can call outside, say, you know, a family member, a couple states away, a friend, and you can kind of report to them, you know, this is where I am, I'm okay. And then the other people in your household, if you're separated, right, they can contact that person and say, oh, have you heard from Jacqueline? Yep, this is where she is, she's fine. And kind of, it's not the most efficient, but 
it gets information um, to different people. Um, and teaching and making sure everyone knows how to text is important too, because texting can often um, be able to uh, transfer easier than, uh, than phone calls during an emergency. I don't begin to understand all that technical stuff. I just know that a text can sometimes get out <laughs> um, when a phone call can't. Um, so for our third and final uh, section about building a kit, right? When we think about building an emergency kit, we wanna start by thinking about what are our essentials. So what do we use on a daily basis that you might do if, um, oh, and, and what you might do if those resources are limited or not available? Um, so with the basics, right? You're looking at food, water. Um, I, I, you know, I like to think about like, what do we really need, right? We need food, water, we need information, we need light, right? A flashlight uh, with batteries, uh, bless you, Kim, um, <laughs> uh, right? Because we need that information to know what's going on. We need a first aid kit to help keep ourselves safe. Um, like I said, mentioned this before, medication is hard, right? It's hard to, uh, you know, be able to stockpile medication just because of the system that we, we live in. So if you can, it's good to have medication into in your kit, but we fully recognize that that's not possible for a lot of people. And so just making sure that you have that prescription information in there. Because um, that's one of the main things Red Cross does after an emergency is we have nurses on staff, we have licensed health professionals that will refill your prescriptions. So we will, we will vouch and say, no, they, you know, they're not trying to refill, the, uh, refill their prescription out of cycle. They really, you know, they've experienced a, an emergency. They are separated from their medication. This is what they need. But, um, but we need to know that information. Um, and so it can really help to have that um, available in your kit uh, when you show up to a Red Cross shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we think about what types of kits you might build, there's two, there's really two different kinds. There's that household kit, which the idea would be, uh, you're not going to move it or carry it with you, right? This is kind of if you needed to shelter in place or um, shelter near your place, right? Um, after earthquakes, sometimes people, uh, we, we see this um, in a lot of different places, right? People don't go back, sorry for that background noise. They don't go back into their home, uh, but they might like camp outside their home, right? Um, and kind of go in and out. They don't sleep in their home. But so that household kit is something that you can put a lot of supplies in um, and not be expected to kind of take it around with you. And then the national standard is really three days. In the Pacific Northwest, we really want to aim for two weeks, and that is directly relevant to our earthquake risk. So it's about two weeks uh, after we experience our earthquake uh, for outside help to come in. That's the estimate um, from like people like FEMA and things. So any any bit is better than none, and we kind of want to strive towards that that two weeks worth of supplies. And then our go bag is like the backpack or duffel bag or, you know, little luggage to go uh, bag, which really is, you know, if we need to evacuate quickly um, and we are looking for, you know, something that you can reasonably carry. Um, and, and so three days worth of supplies thereabouts, I mean, if you're stronger, right, you can put a little more in there, but uh, it's, it's that real kind of mobile version. And the expectation really is that you can carry it and, and off you go. And then when we talk about customizing our kit, right, we've talked about, you know, based on health or medical needs, um, but again, pets and service animals, right? If you need water, they need water, right? Um, right, they, they need all the same things you do. And we wanna put something in our kit that brings us comfort as well and can occupy us, right? Um, if we're away from home, no electricity, uh, you know, no, no internet, if we're in an unfamiliar kind of Red Cross shelter situation, um, shelters can get a little boring. And so having something in there that, you know, not only brings us comfort, but we can do. So playing cards, uh, books, uh, journals, or if you like to draw, write sketch pads, things like that, uh, little games, um, things that don't take electricity. Uh, you can have family photos in there, right, for, for something that brings comfort to you. 
um, a stuffed animal, a pillow, right? Something that's kind of cozy um, to, you know, help you feel better because it, it will be an emergency and we will be, you know, not having the best day of our life. Um, and so, you know, putting a, your favorite snack in there, right? Um, just to be like, yeah, this is a little treat, um, you know, while we're, while we're trying to get through something. Um, so I like to just encourage people to kind of customize it so that they, they have things that they enjoy. And then since you're, you never know where you will be when an emergency happens, um, if you spend a lot of time at work, it might behoove you to, you know, have a small kit at work in case um, you needed to evacuate work and head home. Um, so we're looking at things like appropriate walking shoes, some, some food and water. It's not going to be the end all be all kit, but uh, you know, what would happen if you were at work and you were told, you know, that you needed to go home. Um, and then having a kit in your car can be another good place to start as well. Um, not only are, you know, if we have cars, they're usually close to us, no matter kind of where you are. Mm -hmm. if, if you're home, the car's home. If you're at the grocery store, the car's in the parking lot, right? Um, and so it can be kind of a good central place to put a kit. Um, it also works really well for things like winter storms, um, where if you find yourself on the side of the road or, you know, in a, a large traffic jam where, you know, you're just not going anywhere for a while, having some supplies in your car is, is super helpful that way. It helps you keep warm, some snacks, some water. Again, we're not talking, you know, a huge kit, but, um, and there's no kind of right or wrong answer too when we think about, okay, where we're going to start with building a kit. It, you know, what makes the most sense for you, your family, and the people that you live with? Um, you know, if you drive a lot, you know, your car may be the right place to start. If you're home a lot, you know, start with that home kit. Um, it it kind of just depends on, on individual situations. So finally, as we finish up here, uh, we have some tools that we recommend, uh, right? Is that there's that emergency contact card. Um, and I can actually put a link in the chat uh, to a card that you guys can download if you want. Sure. Um, and then we have some free Red Cross <laughs> apps. Um, the exclamation mark is a, an emergency app, which has lots of good preparedness information, but it also is like, um, if we needed to share where shelter locations were, uh, they, you could find that uh, through the emergency app. And then the Band-Aid is the uh, first aid app, and both of them are free. Um, and the, the first aid, right, if you found yourself, you know, needing a little bit of uh, direction um, in how to do various first aid things, you, know, it could, you can pull up and kind of find those steps there. It, it doesn't replace getting certified in, in first aid, CPR, or things like that, but it can be a useful tool um, if you if you are so inclined to download those. Hmm. And then, you know, our kind of challenge to kind of everyone that we, we talk to, right? Uh, you've taken the first step, right? Kind of thinking about what disasters are most likely in your area. Um, you know, we want to encourage everyone uh, to have a disaster plan and practice using it. If you have one, update it, right? Situations change. Um, People change, their needs change. And then we want everyone, like I said, to have that uh, preparedness kit. And it's a process when you make your kit, right? It's not, there's not an expectation to you know, go out in one day and just get your kit done. Um, you know, there's, you can start with some things that are around your house. Um, I'll also share in the chat after this um, a link to our prepare guide, um, which has a really great list in there about uh, how you, like, how you can kind of start breaking down some of the things in your kit and kind of taking it week by week, month by mm. month. Um, and then we do encourage people, like I said, to, to get trained in first aid and CPR um, and AED. Um, the Red Cross is still offering uh, certification classes. Uh, there's a lot of training that happens online. And then when you are in the classroom, it is all uh, fewer people and all socially distanced and um, a lot of COVID precautions to keep everyone safe. Um, and it's also, you know, something to think of in the future if, uh, if that is still kind of unnerving to, to go into a classroom, but uh, we, we just, we recommend that's an important, uh, important skill for people to have. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see you all better. And I saw Carl, you already 
had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about uh, CPR training. Hasn't that changed in the last five years or so? It used to be when I first got trained a long time ago, it was heart compressions and breathing alternate. Now I think they're discouraging the uh, heart compressions or vice versa, I forget. Um, I, I'll probably defer this to Kim because she's probably way more, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so now we've gone to compression only. So no more mouth to mouth. A lot of people don't want to go mouth to mouth with a stranger anyways, and especially during COVID times, but this has been, research has found that as an adult, you have eight to 10 minutes worth of oxygen still circulating in your system through your blood. And so all we need you to do to buy us time is to just pump their heart by doing the chest compressions, um, middle of the chest. And that's the way the training goes with either the Red Cross or, you know, might be TVF and R down the road, you know, they might do a seminar or something. So that's the way, it, yeah, okay. Yeah, that it, it depends on your level of training. The, the I this I this did one, and we were for our um, for our level, we will still we were still doing the breathing as well as the compressions. But for the very the most basic level, it's just just compressions. Yep, yep, yeah. And the certified trainings that they put on with Red Cross or Cascade or anything like that, they'll get you into like the infant CPR things like that where you do want to do breaths. But overall, when it's an adult which is typically what you fi might find, you know, out in the public setting collapsing, then it's just the chest compressions if they're unresponsive. Kim, do are, are, you know if they're including AED training in all, all levels? Yes, yes, because I know we'll do the AED training out, because we don't do the certified training. We leave that up to Red Cross and Cascade, but yeah, everyone does the AED yep, at all levels. Yeah, I know that's always included um, with Red Cross classes. Yes. The infant is always an option, um, but AED is not, never an option. It's all or is always an option. <laughs> yep. Um, so I put a couple of uh, links into the chat box. So the the first link is to our prepare guide. I see you, Lenny. And the second one is to our um, emergency contact card, if you so wish. Uh, but yeah, what was your question? I noticed that Isha has a question. Our hand is up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could speak at all to, or maybe the Beaverton people here. Um, so I was with a group, we were working on emergency preparedness and all of my friends are in Multnomah County and I'm in Washington County. Um, and Multnomah County has like a whole little neighborhood pod situation set up where you can volunteer to be part of like your community plan. Like it just, it's, and it's easy to search. Anyways, I just, um, I know Red Cross isn't necessarily administering that, um, but I just was really surprised at the differences between Washington County and Multnomah County. And then the fact that I'm right on the border, you know, it, it you're, it's like I could walk there and have a completely different. So I just, um, I wasn't sure if any, somebody specifically could speak to um, either the differences. So I, I so are you, did, were you part of a CERT team in, Multnomah County is that what you're saying and you haven't yeah. been able to find it in Washington County yeah I have my buddies are all part of their neighborhood team well, Washington County has actually has a, a very active cert organization but is that uh, the um where do you find information because you could uh, on their website on the Beaverton City website and this is the like each neighborhood has a little like Heidi spot with supplies. They're, they're, and... they're all, they, they have, they're separated in regions. We're in West Slopes in the wet, red region for the CERT. And they have a very extensive training program and uh, a lot of exercises and things if you want to, you, 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 you can spend almost every waking hour being involved in that if you want. Sure. So, yeah, um, maybe, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, so, so there's CERT, right? Which is the Community Emergency Response Team, which is usually through the, city or even sometimes the fire department kind of oversees that and there's in in portland it's called net uh, but it's the same program uh, just because if you call cert in portland you'll get the swat team <laughs> um but uh right too many acronyms um but are you thinking about a beacon site because because in portland and this is a difference between some of the um 
surrounding counties, we have what they're called like basic emergent, emergency earthquake communication nodes or something like that, beacon, um, where there is like a, a kind of a, a cache of supplies and there's some radio supplies, but um, that is not all over the, the metro area, but CERT teams may have um, kind of caches of supplies too. So um, it does it does vary a lot from, from county to county or from city to city sometimes. Um, but yeah, CERT should be everywhere um, and they would have a much better idea too of, you know, if they do have little pods around because they very well could. Okay. So yeah. Lanny, do you know if you guys still have the uh, Map My Neighborhood literature? We uh, do. So I, uh, you can, you can, I don't know, they used to just have it out in racks at City Hall. Um, but the, it's, it's very good and it actually gives you a step-by-step -step plan. And uh, we've used that to totally organize our street uh, with everybody, with all of the neighbors on here. So uh, if you're, you know, this more want to focus more on your specific neighborhood or the people that, that are around you, it's, it's, it's a really good layout for how to do that. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm glad you mentioned the beacon thing. I ha I'll have to look it up. I can't remember the terminology in which things were called what. Um, but yeah, I just remember looking. I just couldn't find a similar Washington County version of what we were using in Multnomah County. And I think as a renter, um, you know, you move a lot. And so it's not, uh, it's hard to establish in a neighborhood. Um, and so Multnomah County's easy online system that's like, here's all these nodes and here are these places and like, here's where you would go, you know, like that's much easier to move to a new place and find that rather than have to organize within your own neighborhood if it doesn't already exist. And especially because supplies are such a big deal as a renter, um, you know, you, you're not carrying around the same sort of supplies, supplies that homeowners would have access to like chainsaws and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's like an access income inequality kind of thing. So any way to like make information like that more readily available is important to me. Those are all really valid points. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for Jacqueline? I have one. Yeah, Terry. Um, I'll take my hand down. Um, I live very close to Highway 26. And it makes me think that if there were ever, I think of earthquakes, you know, and the bridges fail or whatever happens, all these people are going to get out of their cars and they're just going to pour into our neighborhoods. And I, I've never heard of this cash program, you know, where you cash supplies, but I just think like, you know, that that's a that's an area where I think emergency management might be a, a consideration for emergent emergency management. Because I really, you know, if it happens, they're going to be stuck on, we've already seen people stuck on, on Highway 26 during snowstorms. And, you know, then it's only been a couple of hours. But I was just thinking if something, if there's a really big failure, it's going to really impact our neighborhood. <laughs> and I think it's, we're indicative of, a na of many neighborhoods mm -hmm. around where we're, we have a major highway. Hey, I was just going to tens say, of thousands it's exactly of the opposite, man. We're all going to bail through all those doors going through the sound wall and get out on the highway and then head over to the cemetery where no one's going to be bothered. The people at the cemetery aren't going to care. And that's where you go bail and get everything, uh, get, you know, get everything together and try to get a signal, you know, for your, your phone. But yeah, what, yeah. I mean, if the big one does hit, there's not going to be anybody on the road. You can go right through the, there's doors every, you know, 100 yards through the sound wall. We're out on the highway, not the other way around. No one's want to come in here. Um, so, I mean, to, to Terry's point, yeah, I mean, there's the, we never know when that earthquake's going to happen, right? The, the best case scenario is it happens in the middle of the night. Um, and that would allow less people to be on the road but it, it right those people could very well get out of their cars and start looking for something um the the cash program that is in like the portland specific they try and utilize kind of the natural meeting areas right and so you know no one's no one's pulling up to anyone's home but you know the the parks um and the kind of public spaces right that's where people that's where we think 
people will, um, you know, congregate, right? So they, yeah, they might leave their, their vehicles and, and, but they're going to be looking for those kinds of places that lend themselves to that. Um, and so, I mean, I think it's worth, uh, you know, advocating on behalf of your neighborhood with uh, the county or something like that to kind of see what the, what they're thinking about in terms of something like that. Uh, but, you know, like, I don't think there's just going to be like people going through your neighborhood, but they're going to be going to those kinds of natural areas where people congregate. So, okay. Yeah. That's what we think at least. Right. I mean, human nature. We'll direct them that way. Yeah. We'll direct them to the West Sylvan school. <clears throat> not, I mean, yeah. Schools are, are not a bad place to direct folks. Right. It's a neighborhood gathering place. People know what's there. The, you know, our, our first responders know where they are and, and, you know, they're familiar with the buildings and things like that. So yeah, schools aren't, aren't terrible. So. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think the the critical thing in our neighborhood with the houses being built in in the in the fifties and and that is uh, is to absolutely ensure that you've done a seismic upgrade to your house so that your house is going to be reasonably habitable if there is an earthquake because once it slides off the foundation then you're you're pretty much out of luck and I've I've done a little bit of analysis on this and decided that you know. I, probably not going to do a go bag because I'm staying here. I, I if, if there's a major earthquake, um, I've thought about it and I, I have no idea where we would go. So I think so, we're better off and we're, we're able to hang out here probably a couple months. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. But that's for the earthquake, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we learned this year that fire got closer to our urban areas than ever before yeah, I, think, I, I, think, I think from my experience on being on a hotshot crew um, I'm not worried well, about know. forest okay. fire coming through here Carl may worry about it because he has he has a huge wood lot in his backyard there but, uh, <laughs> but, even, but I think where I am uh, right here I'm soil stays okay. wet year round man no <laughs> even you know our our ice storm right folks were were out of power for so long that they were leaving their home uh, so go bags are good for things like that right it's it's not a you know, it's not a every emergency will solve, you know, be solved with a, with a go bag, but um, you know, there, it serves its purpose for, for different, for different emergencies. And, and it's up to anyone, it's up to you know, individuals to kind of decide you know, wh where they, what they want to do and what they want to focus on. But I wouldn't discount a go bag just because your plan is to stay you know, where well, you I can, I, can I, I have a backpack or two, so I could put one together if I needed to. But I, I think from my evaluation of, and I, I've taught wilderness survival and for the military and, and for my company, and uh, we're, we're, this is, you know, it's going to be fortress on Walnut Lane, pretty much, uh, you know, unless it's destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to go to Joe's house. <laughs> yeah. Um, next to a cemetery your, your lack of preparation may not constitute uh, benevolence or a feeling of crisis on my part. So Ooh. keep that in mind. All right. Hey, on that happy note, we need to move <laughs> on. And uh, yeah, we got other things to handle tonight. Um, I uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Jack Lane for doing a great job. Thank you very much. Cool thank you. Thank you, for, yeah, thank you for having me. It was nice to meet you all. And I hope you have a lovely evening. Cool. Okay, so while we have a quorum before somebody leaves, hold up. Okay, Chris, one, two, three. Okay, yeah, we got it. All right, um, the ladies at the uh, Eden Gardens want some more money this year. They're extorting us, man. They're going to love it. Oh, See you later. Thank you, Cam. You did a great job. Thank you. You're wonderful. Um, so yeah, I got an email from from them from Michelle. Uh, no, not Michelle Wilson. I forget. Oh, Bauman. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna have to approve. They haven't given me a, a bill yet. I think we gave them like two hundred bucks last year, which is more than they wanted. And so they uh, I, they shouldn't need any more seeds. I think they just need more dirt. So if it comes up. And they said, hey, where are you going, Karen? You need your vote on this. I'm just going to get my power. I'm running out of power. 
Hey, Carl, can you back up? Can you back up a little bit on your explanation? I don't know what Eden Gardens is or or what what you're you're asking for. What's that? Can can you just give me a little background? I'm not sure oh, what oh. you're talking about. Oh, this is that little garden plot down there across from the uh, Canyon Grill at the bottom of the hill, bottom of Canyon. Canyon Lane in, in Canyon. And, okay. Uh, okay. A, a ladies gardening group that uh, has been taking care of that for many years. And uh, last year we gave them some money to, in order to get some more dirt and some some fresh plants. And uh, now they're uh, asking for some more. And but they haven't given me uh, you know an amount, so we'll have to think about that between now and the next next meeting. But we definitely have it in the uh, treasury. Do we know how much we have in the treasury? Uh, I think it's like twenty two hundred bucks, something like that. If our treasurer was here, we'd have a definitive answer. Uh, is he anyway? Uh, he's probably walking his dog around in front of my uh, in front of my house as we speak. Um, okay, so it, I'll wait and get an amount from them, but uh, we just need to think about that and say, yeah, it's cool. Or, you know, hundred to one or hundred. Well, can we um, can we make a since we do have a quorum? Could I make a motion that we? Um, approve an amount not to exceed two hundred dollars to the Eden Garden Group. I like that. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, that is our motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Uh, there's somebody was supposed to. You know, uh, Dieter, where's your friend that was going to tell us about the recycling events? Yes, uh, that went away. Uh, apparently, they are not going to do the shredding at uh, the, the church. They will do the shredding at AAA, and somebody will um, come forward and apply for a, a speaking slot um, if warranted. Okay. That was a, a last-minute change. Thank you okay. for bringing it up. So, uh, so their event might not, it's not till May, so they could come by uh, in April? Um, you know, this may be... Um, Pretty, as far as I remember, the, the, the AAA one is uh, April 24th. So it will be shortly after our next meeting. Mm. Well, if we can help them, we'll help them. Yeah, the good news is nobody wants money from us. <laughs> they just want our support and to get some uh, uh, publicity for, for one thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. So next month, uh, we've got uh, some uh, fellows coming in from the city of Beaverton to talk about a capital improvement plan for a drainage system uh, down uh, at the end of 75th where it hits Canyon Lane. Uh, uh, my neighbors that live down there have been experienced uh, excessive runoff over the years. A couple times a year, they have a huge lake covering the street. And uh, so the city has, has come up with a plan. We are gonna be meeting with the engineer and the, uh, the lead guy for this project, but it has not been fully approved yet. So they're gonna come talk mm -hmm. to us uh, with they're, they're putting together the plan now. The hope was that they would be at this meeting, but uh, they needed some more time, which was fine to put. Carl, I assume that. that's that's the area in, in the low spot in 75th. Yes, well, it, what it, happens it is descends the water, from the north and the south, and there's a drainage very yes, low. It spot comes down the from the uh, the garden property, uh, the THPR and D property, and down through. Uh, all the properties and then it ends up right in the middle of 75th where there's the big dip yeah where did. it goes you know higher up towards my house and higher up towards canyon lane and there's no more it has no way to drain and it looks uh, like there's a new house going in on 75th don't get that, them started. that has nothing to do with it that's the guy next door to me man that's yeah. whole, that's a whole different situation yeah. this is helping out the existing homes uh, including uh, Joseph Hughes' house. I don't know if you ever met that guy, but uh, all this water basically is the headwaters uh, for the mighty creek that flows behind my house. 
which never has had a name, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it flows underneath 26 and it ends up joining a uh, creek Golf with a name, Creek, Golf Golf creek, creek. which flows yeah. down the, behind the, the cemetery, the bottom of the cemetery. So th yeah, these are the headwaters for the creek. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, <laughs> uh, not to get too f far into this, but they, uh, the city showed up and paved 75th Avenue. Uh, oh man, more than 10 years ago. But when they did it, they created a berm there that, and eliminated, that's why the water keeps laking up in front of these people's house. And, uh, or, you know, actually it affects like 10 houses. That's why it's uh, worthy of the knack to uh, you, know, you know, help them out or give our support to have this project done because we've done, we're doing the same thing with the uh, the athletic field over at the middle school. I mean, that that only affects twenty houses or less, but it's worth it because they're nice people and they're part of the NAC. So mm -hmm. I was figuring this is enough houses to give it some consideration for us. And uh, so they're going to uh, present their uh, project and what they have so far, but it still is not on the uh, agenda yet for a, a capital improvement on the capital improvement list. I guess what you call it, right? When when something when the city's going to go ahead and put something in your neighborhood, right? The, the big book we get every year. Hey, so Carl, I got it. Oh, capital improvement plan, something like that. Can I, can I ask a question, Carl? Sure. So I remember at the last meeting, we talked about this and the need to get some attention to those folks down on 75th. Um, but there's also other other flooding problems within West Slope. And I think there's just general curiosity how neighbors bring that to the city's attention and how it gets on that CIP list or whatever it's called. So I, I know we sort of talked about maybe having the, I don't know what the position's called, but public public utilities director or whoever it is that, that makes that list and prioritizes the project just mm -hmm. so we know and we can tell our neighbors, okay, if you have a flooding problem, here's who you talk to and here's how the process works and here's how you can get your project addressed too. And I think mm -hmm. there might be some interest in that and we might get quite a few participants in a meeting if we had someone like that who could answer those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Right, well, that's, that's who's showing up. Uh, one guy is the lead engineer okay uh, uh, but it's a, it sounded like they were talking about that specific problem i'm gonna ask you or something like that anyway he's a really nice guy uh, okay and then his boss too is going to be online with us as well so these so, will be two of the guys that are you okay. know, part of making those kind of decisions for several projects not just just this one okay so we we can ask him general questions next week or next sure, week. i'll give him i'll give him plenty of time i don't have anything else lined up for april yet Okay, thank you. Yeah, you might want to be very specific on when you send the, the notice out uh, for the meeting. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people probably attend if they knew they could ask questions oh, yeah, to somebody well, like yeah. that. Well, you're gonna, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about those people who live up and down like Canyon Lane that have driveways with trench or, you know, trench trains right in front of their garages that are on at the bottom of steep driveways and then they, they experience uh flooding a lot and there's also people yeah. up and down uh, canyon lane that we've heard from over the years because water runs down that hill from canyon lane to canyon road and which is part of the you know that's what they're going to explain you know it's just mm -hmm. part of what's going on okay. uh, this is yeah, just <laughs> This little this project is just a slight mitigation. Yeah, they're not going to. It'll uh, anyway. That's a good question that, that would come up. You know, how do we mitigate more of the water that's going through people's backyards and uh, you know building up in front of driveways and things like that? And they should be able to help us out. You know, because for one thing, on seventy fifth. I looked at my water bill after I got finished talking to my neighbor, or not my water bill, my uh, utility bill from the city, and th there's a, a $12 a month 
uh, sewer upgrade charge on that. And my street's never had any sewer upgrade since I've lived here 20 years. And so we're basically, uh, they, their explanation was that we, uh, we're paying for the, you know, upgrades and new, new systems all over the city. So if you live in Beaverton, everybody gets dinged the same amount on their utility bill, regardless if you ever, if you've ever had any upgrades or if you need them whatsoever, you're still paying for that maintenance. Yeah, and so we're asking for a, just a little bit to help out and uh, mitigate <laughs> this situation uh, because we all pay the same taxes. Yeah, I think it'd be useful to know what the state of the sewer system is in the neighborhood. How, when it was put in, how long it's been there, and you know if they anticipate any maintenance well, being required in the near future. I remember when I first uh, uh, started coming to your meetings, Joe. Was they had Kennedy Lane totally torn up? They they redid well, they, that whole they system up, right down the middle. Up but there, it, but right? uh, I was just thinking about my house specifically because it runs down between. You know, it's not in the street. It actually runs down between the. Uh, on the along the property line between all the houses here on Walnut Lane and, and Canyon Lane, and I have, <laughs> I know nothing's been done to it, and I just wonder how old it is, and when do they think they might have to do something? Well, mm. that's well, you know, for instance, that house you're talking about that's right next to me, they could only get, uh, they're only going, you know, single family residence, one story, actually, it's probably going to be two stories, but the second story is going to be going down towards the creek. Mm -hmm whereas the first story is going to be level with the street. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they wanted to split the lot and put in two houses, but the, the sewer system won't support it. Uh, yeah. And that's why they got denied. And, they, and now the guy's just building one that he's going to probably sell for the same amount that uh, that guy sold that one over on uh, West Slope. Uh, what, what is it? Westview Lane or whatever. For a million five. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I haven't walked past that last time, so it's probably been two months since I would have been by there. It was vac still vacant at that point, really. I, but yeah. they did build it, yeah. It's, it's it hasn't sold. Well, I think they're doing okay over the, all those ones that the uh, 75th Terrace that BG made started. Yeah, a million. I, I think those seem to be selling pretty well, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, ran, uh wait, wait a minute, Mike BG. Yes, Mike DG. Nice guy. Yeah. Anyway, he's probably even nicer now that he's <laughs> selling all his houses. <clears throat> anyway. Okay, let's see if there's anything else. So those guys are coming next month. Talk about capital improvement. Uh, ladies need funding. Uh, the recycling event is now put off until late April. So we'll hear from those people again. Okay. And then, um, do you see that in the comments that Isha is, it, is um, happy to give an update on the window contest? Yeah, I want to hear about this. Cool. Um, yeah, so we, uh, the window contest uh, came and went. Um, we had, so I personally walked around about 280 um, slips of paper around, and so 280 houses were canvassed um, with an invite and then the Facebook uh, invites went out and next door and such. Um, the library did promote us, um, but I think it's tough. Anyways, I think a lot more promotion could have happened, um, but that's a tough time for those sorts of things. Anyways, we had eight uh, houses register and participate um, and the winners were the three houses that had children involved, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of them were really cute. So I thought I would put, I'm going to just put together like a picture. Thank you. That's like, thank you to everybody who participated with some of the pictures and stuff, um, as well as some of the flowers that we found in people's yards as I was going around um, taking pictures. And um, yeah, so I just have to still um, send out thank you cards. And um, I... I uh, need to touch base with Miles to get finish getting the gift cards, but I would say it was very successful. Um, eight out of 280 is actually a pretty good number for like a complete cold call participation system. So um, yeah, I'm really happy and I'm grateful for the sport and I hope 
that um, I had my stuff in, I live on Canyon Road, so I had my stuff like as a banner in front of my yard. Um, and I hope that was visible and I hope people saw it and I'm planning on taking it down, but yeah, I had fun and I hope other folks uh, got a chance to see that too. Well done. Woohoo! <laughs> Great yeah. job. I think the next contest is going to be garden gnomes. <laughs> There's a garden gnome hiding in the bushes on Canyon Lane. Is that somebody's? Is that the one you know about? I only got like 10 a, of them in my yard. There's like a carved out little alcove, right? As it intersects with Canyon Road. Anyways, um, yeah, no, I thought that was really fun. And the people who participated, like I said, the, sub, the um, two houses in particular, the kids put a ton of work and had like a full mural um, on their window and stuff, so. So where will you post the winners? Will you do that on our Facebook, the Westlope uh, Facebook page? Or I'd love to be able to see your pictures. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, uh, nobody ended up giving me permissions to do any of that. So I don't have access to any of that. Um, I can send it or is like, if somebody is, yeah, I'm happy to put it up there. I think, um, I think you have to be approved. Or you, oh. sorry, you, you can't just comment on the Facebook page. It has to be like a post anyways. Um, but yeah, that was my, that's my plan. Do you mean Planning, in terms can, of, you, can you help is ISA do that? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Can I help you with that? Yeah, I think at one point Miles had tried to add me as an admin on the West Slope page um, and that just didn't work out. So if we were willing to revisit that, that yeah. for me. Okay. Yeah. You've got my email. Let's talk. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other old business? Any other new business? Um, not specifically related to the NAC, but um, I'm uh, now one of the uh, House District Leader, Democratic Party House District Leaders for House District 34. And so, yeah, so I'm helping organize the Get Out the Vote uh, Neighborhood Leader Program. And so let me know if you'd like to participate in that. Uh, typically, we assign, you know, 35, 40 houses um, for you to be responsible for contacting the people. In the COVID times, uh, basically, we're providing postcards and um, and you get to, if you can address and mail out the postcards, that's pretty much what's <laughs> the process these days. But um, it's it's been pretty successful for the, the people we've been working with. We get 90, 95 to 100 percent participation for people voting. So if you'd like to do it in your neighborhood, uh, let me know and we can get you set up. What what races would you cover? For example, would you cover the city council race? This, the yes. Um, the, so the um, Washington County Democrat Central Committee people can apply for their endorsement. And so I think we've had 11 people apply and, be in, uh, and have been endorsed uh, by the Washington County Democrat organization. And that's for school boards and, you know, anything in Washington County, basically. What about city council? Yes. I think I, I would have to go check and see where the endorsements are. We had a very, very long meeting uh, last month to do the endorsements. So I don't remember <laughs> city council specifically. I know there's Tualatin Hills Park and Rec and some of the other uh, uh, Forest Grove and Tualatin and some of the other city areas. So there'll probably be an endorsement for the Democratic, for the, uh, for Beaverton City Council if someone is asked to be endorsed. Because uh, uh, real quick, uh, yeah, like I said, that guy's building that property next to my house. He finally pulled his uh, prints just month and a half ago, so he's rolling. Uh, but while he was down there at City Hall, he said, hey, your neighbor's uh, running for city council. Because when they announced the race, I just 
I sent in and asked for an application just to see what was involved. And so she, she told this guy that I was running. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Once I, it took me like uh, two minutes to realize it's a ton of time, man. You got to go yeah. every day. Well, the, the, the 18th is your last day if you <laughs> change your mind. <laughs> no. <laughs> no way. All right. Any other new business? Okay. Uh, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Uh, do I have uh, eyes? Aye. Aye. And okay. I'm not voting. Planning. I'm not voting, but I just wanted to say that there's more comments in the chats. Do you guys see the chats over here? Mm. The chat section? I'll just that more... one from that gal at Rebecca that's left real quick. Yeah. I, I didn't have a chance to read the whole thing. Okay. And then Isha was saying that she'd like to have more background about the boundaries of this NAC, like why some, some people aren't in the in the NAC and why others aren't are and aren't. So I just wasn't sure if you were seeing that that portion, yeah. but that, that's a it's a complicated question. Uh oh, looks like Carl yeah, Todd Knapp has a question. Yeah, I, just wanted, I just wanted to say that um it's a, a, I'm sorry I missed December or January's meeting. I just <clears throat> write the things on my calendar, but sometimes I blow it off anyway. But glad I can be here this meeting. And uh, um, I'm on the wrong side of Canyon Road, so I can't vote in your meetings. But anything I can participate in, I'm going to be. So I won't be raising my hand for yays or nays on any of these votes since I'm not actually within your boundaries. But I'm in the neighborhood. Well, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to it. To it to attend online or in person when we do that. But it is, this, is, this is a strange area between unincorporated Washington County and Multnomah County and, yep. and Beaverton. And it's, it's just weird, but yeah, uh, yeah we're, we're happy to have anyone attend. <laughs> we call it the Swiss cheese map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, thank you everybody. A productive meeting. Um, all right. And once again, yeah, the, the gal from uh, Red Cross was great. She did a good job. And so did Kim Hahn from TVF and R. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I, again, if, you know, we've I've done a lot of work, and if anyone's interested and want to wants to give me a call and chat about you know the things we've done on the street to be prepared, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Once again, his name is Joe Whittington. <laughs> and he lives on Walnut Lane. <laughs> but if you're hungry, there may not be food for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But he's got lots of hanging fruit out there. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I thought that um, the more the neighbors were prepared, the, the less we would have to deal with them. So anyway, there you, go. you might think about that on your street as well. <laughs> cool well we'll get another speaker along those lines uh, that we can talk right. with you know that might have a you know there's all kinds of perspectives on that and and you know like for instance like i just said if you got i got fruit trees all over the place and i can't wait for my blackberries to come out because i pick them all you know and uh, same thing with yeah just planting some raspberries too they're coming right up so it's uh it's a good neighborhood for that. And so we could all live off our trees if, if the big <laughs> one hits. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to say, all right. Utah, go have see you later. Fun. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. I mean, Lanny. Lonnie's my uncle. You're Lanny. I Lanny, yeah. Lanny. No, yeah. Like, like I know, right? It makes it really confusing. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>